Paramount Pictures Love and Monsters is now available to purchase on 4K, Blu-ray, DVD, and of course, video on demand. If you haven't seen it yet, well, if you like apocalypses, dogs, monsters, love, there's pretty much something for everyone. You can find my spoiler-free movie review on popcornerreviews.com. I'll have a link below in my description, but today I'm super excited to share with you an exclusive interview with Steve Boyle. He worked on the special effects for the monsters in the film, and it was really really cool to learn about what goes into the making of these horrifying creatures in this film, what he thinks when he gets to see the finished product, and how much work really goes in behind the scenes to bring these creatures to life. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. Make sure to watch Love and Monsters now on 4K, Blu-ray, and DVD. And of course, don't forget the minestrone. Well, thank you, Steve, so much for taking the time. I know it's morning for you. It's night for me. So you're having coffee and I'm just, you know, winding down. But thanks for taking the time. Uh, I was really excited to watch Love and Monsters. I actually got to watch it twice in the recent couple of months. But first, I did see on your IMDb profile that you were credited to working on 30 Days of Night. And I have yeah. to say, that movie scarred me a little bit. I am embarrassed to say maybe I cannot go outside anymore at night without looking at the rooftops to make sure there's not a vampire standing on it. So that stuck with me. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so with Love and Monsters, you know, there's so much that goes on in the making of a movie, let alone a monster movie. Can you talk a little bit about the work you did with special effects and kind of what went on behind the scenes there? Yeah, um, well, I was I was approached by a friend of mine to, to come on board, um, uh, Matt Sloan, who was a visual effects supervisor. Um, and um, he and I worked on and off together for the last 20 years or so. Um, and, um, but yeah, I was, the, the designs had already been done. I was just hired to come on board and, uh, and head up a crew where we'd be sculpting and doing the molding and the fabrication and the puppeteering on set. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it was always going to, in fact, there was, I was going to say a lot of it was going to be digital. I was surprised by how much was practical in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I thought the approach would be just like it was with the frog. Uh, the pool frog where we'd just be building tongues and all that kind of stuff and then the the digital guys who were just amazing like that stuff looked insane um uh but we ended up building a lot more full creatures as well and you know doing the mavis puppet which was all practical and all that kind of stuff so when you build those full creatures do they have like a mobility range or are they pretty much static and then the cgi comes in and kind of adds the motion and the movement or, or how i guess how workable are they on set uh it, it depends on the creature there were some just static ones that did nothing like there was um uh the sensor gator which was dead in a room which was just a static prop mm -hmm. then we had um hand puppets of like the the gobbler creatures that we knew were going to be replaced by CGI. And so ones that shot out of the ground and got decapitated, all that kind of stuff. Um, the Mavis robot was fully articulated and puppeteered by rods. Um, and um, then uh, the buzzard in the bunker had um, Toby Barron uh, inside it uh, <laughs> and he was puppeteering the thing. So the mandibles were actually his hands. Wow. Um, <laughs> It was, yeah, it was as low tech as it gets, which is why it was so great. Yeah, I think those are the best ones, honestly. Uh, I yeah. mean, how, how much time really goes into that too? Because, you know, we see it all come together. How much time pre-movie pre shooting and everything do you guys spend putting those pieces together? Oh, it takes ages. And um, what takes the time is the boring stuff. It's making, I shouldn't say it's boring. It's very important. But all the mold making and, and, and um all that kind of stuff just takes ages mm -hmm. uh, because there's so many pieces to these things and then they have to all be put together and sometimes they don't work first time and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, but, yeah, it always takes a long time to put together. It's always worth it. I was going to say, but Love and Monsters was one of those ones where, um, yeah, the amount of time we had was not a lot mm. um, and uh, pretty much everything was ready just before it was ready to go on set. That happened every time. It was pretty brutal. <laughs> um because more and more things kept on getting thrown into the mix mm -hmm. but um yeah how could you not want to just jump in and do it it was just <laughs> awesome 
So by the time you actually get to watch the movie or see any cuts where some of the CGI and everything is added in, are you ever surprised at kind of how it comes together or are you expect it to look the way it does when we get to see it? Um, yes, yeah, that's an interesting question because sometimes you're really disappointed and then other times it's like, oh my God, I saw it every day and I didn't think it was going to be that awesome. Um, <laughs> What, what surprises me, I think, with, with um, Love and Monsters is it, it was all, it, normally things change in post-production. Things get rewritten, um, characters get edited out, or um, the, the creatures that we made months ago get replaced with digital ones and they change the design and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a surprise to see it. But this pretty much remained exactly the same as all the, the storyboards, all the designs, nothing really changed. That was the, the thing I was most happy about mm -hmm. was, wow, everything was stuck to, all those, all those meetings, everything. Everyone stuck to what they were going to do. And I actually credit the director for that because um, it'd be so easy to want to redesign and tweak things, but he just stuck to the plan, mm -hmm. it seemed like, from our end anyway. And I think that's why it works so well. It's probably a big sigh of relief knowing how many hours you put in that you actually get to see it come to life and hit the screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was really happy with it. I was really happy with what was what, what was left in there because I, I was totally expecting that, oh, are they going to replace that thing and that thing? Um, but no, they didn't. Did you have a favorite monster that you worked on for the film? Um, the bunker creature, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, that the spider one in the shower. I think probably this was the most fun to do. Well, you know, we've been through a lot this year, but do you think you could survive a monster apocalypse if it came to that? Yeah, I think so. I'd just dress up as one of them, blend in. I've got all the suits. That's true. You could put one together and camouflage right in. I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, I'll just get straight out there. It's all good. <laughs> so I also saw that you know you've done a lot of special effects makeup and prosthetics and you know you've worked on different aspects of production do you have a favorite part that you like to work on or do you like you know trying everything and and kind of being able to experience bits and pieces of all the worlds I I like all of it um I think that um yeah I've always been into writing and directing my own stuff and designing and then doing special effects and um, sometimes I like to design it. Other times I like to do it when other people have designed it. Mm -hmm. I, I like all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I like to, um, uh, I, I get bored if I'm doing the same thing always. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, I, I like just using all parts of my brain and just um, getting better at different, different things. Mm -hmm. um, and that skill I have over here helps that thing over there. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I like about it all. Well, it definitely seems like you have a passion for monsters and horror films. Did you have some favorites growing up that kind of influenced you or kind of, you know, pushed your interest in that direction? Oh, yeah, lots. Um, like all people, like all the effects artists, you know, that my peers, we grew up together. Or, uh, this is the same movie as American Wolf in London and The Thing and The Fly, mm -hmm. uh, Star Wars. Um, yeah, all that stuff. But also the, the earlier things, like all the Hammer Horror movies I loved. I still love them. I still watch them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but anything that just felt like imagination unleashed, you know? Um, yeah, all of it. Inspired me then, inspires me now. Mm hmm well, uh, speaking of Star Wars, I am a Star Wars fan, and I also saw that you were a creature technician in Attack of the Clones. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Senator Askak, am I saying it correctly? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Pascal Gente, who was all but cut out of the movie. Well, um, like working on a Star Wars film. I know, yeah, th that was amazing. It was as exciting as you think it would be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I, I remember thinking, um, uh, you know, it would be great to get out of Australia to do that kind of stuff. So I was blown away when it actually came to us. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. really is blown away. It was such a great experience. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll, I'll leave you with one more question. Just one thing my husband and I was just talking about, because we're big movie people and, you know, just CGI versus the actual build of the creatures and then with makeup and prosthetics, mm -hmm. which do you, I mean, I know things change with technology and experience, but which do you prefer to work with and which one do you think looks better on screen? Uh, the best thing is when you combine them all. When, when you design something that they complement each other and you don't know which part was practical, which was digital. Because mm -hmm. I think then you just believe a character. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the way to do it is um, uh, instead of designing something where you, where you go straight away thinking this is going to be digital, this is going to be practical, I think you've got to design the character first and then um, figure out which, which tools you're going to use. But I mean, obviously I'm biased towards practical because um, it's just, it's, it's more fun. Yeah. Um, I think it's more fun because at the end of the day, we're just covered in blood, covered in slime and it's all in the car and you're dragging stuff up the stairs and all these body parts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I prefer that tangent aspect of it. Do you ever end up taking pieces home from sets with you? Do you have a room that's just stacked full of goodies? I've got, a, I've got a storage shed full of stuff, yeah. There's <laughs> autopsy bodies, there's creatures, there's all sorts of stuff. Perfect um, Halloween and having a really cool get-together or scary yard. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny you should say that because when it comes to Halloween, I'm the most boring person in the world. It just kind of <laughs> it's feels like every work. day, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. A lot of fun watching Love and Monsters and hearing kind of the making of it behind the scenes. So I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much.